again. So let's get into the joints. Okay, there's a lot of noise coming from somebody. Come back. Okay, welcome come back. Okay. Um so moving on. Uh as far as the joints go, um we have different types of uh, joints. We have immovable joints, and in this picture here, you see in the skull, those are immovable. Um, we actually call those sutures. And so when we're born, they're actually in such a way that it creates a soft spot. And that soft spot, we call it a fontanelle, allows the head to go through the, the uh, pelvic girdle. Um, that's why women's hips open up during puberty to allow for the babies to go through that, that channel, through that opening. Um, and then after birth, the, the plates, it's almost like the tectonic plates of the earth. So if you guys felt the earthquake a couple of weeks ago, that's what was happening. There was a slippage in the tectonic plate and it shifted. And so same thing here, the bones will shift. Eventually they come to rest and they seal up and they create these sutures. And those are those are called considered joints, and they're called immovable joints. Then you have slightly immovable joints, which are usually found in the spine. And you see the two bones, the the, vertebr the vertebrae, and in between you have the disc, and that helps to cushion it. Unfortunately, what happens, and not just in the spine, but also in the other joints like the hip joints, finger joints, things like that, is that the the disc, the cartilage, starts to wither away. And you can start getting bone against bone. And so that's what arthri arthritis is, the, the weathering away of the joint. And then the pain comes from the bones rubbing against each other. So um, like hip and, and knee, knee problems, they could replace the area. They'll cut off the bone or, or part of the bone. They'll dig in. They'll put a rod in there. And then they put uh, uh, metal pieces with like Teflon in there to help with the gliding. And so now it's no longer bone against bone. Now it's freely movable. Um, so as far as the motions of the joints, the first one we talked about earlier was flexion and extension. Remember with flexion, you are, you are, decreasing that that angle and so I always think about flexion when you're flexing with your with your with your neck now when you go down like this are you increasing or decreasing the the angle increasing nope the other one decreasing it's decreasing because the normal curvature is more of an S, or, yeah, no, it's a C. And so when you go forward, you're decreasing that joint. When you go back, that's what we call hyperextension. You're hyperextending it back. Hmm. 
Okay. Next up. Uh, we talked about abduction and adduction. Remember, add ADD, you're adding it to the body, so you're bringing it in while abduction is going away. With circumduction, we're able to go round and round. Get back over there. And then pronation and supination. So remember the anatomical position we were talking about? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah. with pronation, we got to think about going prone, right? At least that's a good way to think about it. You're going prone. And so... When I go, and I got to make sure I, I could see myself. Okay. So that part, is that the anterior or posterior? Anterior. That's the anterior. Anterior, sorry. That's the anterior, right? That's. And so if, I, if I'm going like this, am I showing the anterior or posterior part of it? Posterior. It's what? Posterior. Posterior. No. Nope. No. Remember, that's that's the normal anatomical position. Okay. So if I I have my hand like this, I have my hand like this, and I turn it up. Here's the palm of my hand. What did I just do? You see what I mean? Yeah. So I have it like this. I go up. Now, the positions we learned earlier, when it's up, what is that position called? Supine. Exactly. So that's supination, where we put it supine. And now when we turn it to the back, where the back's exposed, prone, what position do we call that? Pronation. Pronation. So supination, pronation. Okay. Supination, pronation. Did that help? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So we were talking earlier about, about bones, the musculoskeletal system involved with creating blood. So there is a lot of blood in the bone marrow. So a fracture to a big bone, such as a femur, can lead to big bleeding, a lot of bleeding, including swelling of, of the area, such as a femur. You're going to have the, the thigh get really, really big. So you see the vasculature here. You have a lot more within the arrow. I'm sorry, the marrow. And then you have blood vessels up in the spongy bone part of it as well. Okay. Um, so, yeah, bone injuries can be very bad uh, because of the bleeding. I mean, if you break a finger, there's not a lot of vasculature there in the finger. But like I said, you fracture a femur, you're really talking about a lot of blood. Uh, just put it this way. The average adult has five liters of blood. With one broken, or uh, we call it fractured, is, is a break in the, in the bone. One fractured femur, the patient can lose a liter of blood, which is 20%. It doesn't sound like a lot, but just know more than 40%, you could be unconscious and even, even be dead. So 20% really is a big deal.
Okay. Uh, <laughs> as far as um, musculoskeletal system, the muscles, um, the muscles themselves, there are three types of muscles. Okay, I'm trying to find who's making that. Oh, okay. Um, three types of muscle. The first one is skeletal muscle, also known as voluntary muscle. In other words, for me to be able to do this, like that, that's voluntary, right? My mind is telling those muscles to contract and relax to cause movement. So that's all voluntary. Whereas the smooth muscle, you find smooth muscle in um, like the intestines, the esophagus. Smooth muscle is involuntary. So think about this. You just, I'm sure you guys just had breakfast or you probably ate something, right? So. How did the the food get from your mouth into your stomach? Did you take a bite and you go? Mm. <laughs> like try to move it down to your stomach? No, no, <laughs> no, right? Y your body took care of it for you. Anybody know what that muscular process is called when when uh, the digestive tract is moving food down? Your smooth muscle? Yeah, it's it's a smooth muscle, but there's there's a name for that that muscular contractions. Anybody know? If you don't know, that's fine. I just know that saliva helps it to break down the food. So that's about it. Correct. There's enzymes in the saliva that helps break down the foods. The process of moving the food down into the stomach, and then also actually intestines. And it takes it into, um, then it helps expel it when you go number two. It's the same process. That process is called peristalsis. So that's the process of, of moving food throughout the digestive tract. Okay. What was the name again? Peristalsis? The name. Peristalsis. Peristalsis. Okay. Just making sure. Is that one in the book? I'm not sure. But uh, I'm just giving you information so you understand what's happening. Okay. Now, the other thing about peristalsis is while it works up top, it also works down below. So just expect to need to go to the bathroom soon because you just ate. So as your food is moving up on top, it's also going to be moving it down down below, causing you to go number two. If you think about it, don't you usually go number two after you have breakfast? Never. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Chat, what's up in the chat? Oh, and the last type of muscle that's only found in one place, and that's cardiac muscle. Now, what, it is, what is in your book what is in your book is a unique feature about cardiac muscle. Okay. And the cardiac muscle 
or the cardiac muscle's unique feature is automaticity. Who can define automaticity for me? Generates an impulse on its own. There you go. It's the ability to generate its own electrical impulse. So that's why I was telling you earlier, the brain needs the heart, but the heart doesn't need the brain. In other words, the brain doesn't tell the heart, go ahead and beat. Now, the brain can tell it to speed up or slow down, but the brain cannot tell the heart to beat. Unlike breathing, the brain tells itself to breathe or not breathe. Or actually breathe faster, breathe slower. So the brain needs a heart, but the heart doesn't need the brain? Correct. Um, the reason being is automaticity. The cardiac muscle itself is originating that electrical impulse for it to, to beat. So it just generates an old impulse. So remember in um, Mortal Kombat where they take out the dude's heart? I forget what they say. And then he's holding it in his hand and you see the heart beating. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's automatic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There you go. Finish them. And then he goes, takes out the heart, and he's holding his hand, and the heart's going, boom, 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 boom. Because of automaticity, the heart can do that on its own without the brain telling it to do it. Cool, huh? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So. Uh, we had Andrew and Brandon. So Brandon continues managing the patient's airway and ventilation. Andrew has directed another EMT to apply direct pressure to the groin wound. As he applies occlusive dressings to the chest wounds, and when we get to chest trauma, we'll, we'll figure out what occlusive dressings are. Uh, one of the chest wounds is two centimeters inferior to the left clavicle in the midclavicular line, and the other is four centimeters inferior to the nipple in the mid-axillary line. So... Based on that, tell me, I'm going to withdraw my camera so you guys can tell me. So uh, there's my chest. So tell me where the first injury is. What does it say? And then tell me, so I'm pointing. I got my opponent. So you tell me where to point for the first injury. Right below your left clavicle, so right above oh, your nipple, yeah. mid mid chest, right above your nipple, maybe halfway. Right above my nipple. A little my bit nipple's more down here. Yeah, so maybe Where? around that area, that area, around that area. Let's see. I had to change screen so so I could see what I'm doing. Okay. One of the chest wounds is two centimeters inferior to the left clavicle in the midclavicular line. Two centimeters is about an inch down. Here's my clavicle right here. So that's like four inches. That would do what? You'd be your collarbone. Yeah, my clavicle is my collarbone. It says... Two centimeters inferior to the left clavicle in the midclavicular line. So here's my clavicle. Here's the midclavicular line. It lines up with my nipple line. It's right in here. So the one's about right here. Okay. So tell me about the second one. Tell me where to point. Below your... Right below your nipple, four centimeters down. Oh, wait, that's me. Oh. 
So it will be in your on your side. The underarm. It'll be right, just right below your um, your Arpit. nipple or your breast line. Okay, so here's my nipple. Wait, I gotta find it. <laughs> here's somewhere. I don't know. I have to look, but it's probably right in here. Oh, okay, I found it. <laughs> okay, so how far down? Four centimeters. Four centimeters. Four centimeters. And then. And then your then side. It. Underarm area. Or right below. Right there in that area. Right in here? Mid axillary. Okay. Still there. Okay. My lungs are underneath there. Okay, good. All right, moving on. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Okay, how can a stab wound to the chest impair ventilation and oxygen? Because you could puncture one you of punct your lips. Puncture lung, the lungs. One your lungs. Yeah, it punctures one of your lungs. And so, what does that mean, though? So puncture lung, then what? It could end up collapsing one of your lungs, constructing your airway. Okay. So it can collapse a lung and cause you to have more difficulty breathing uh, because you're losing lung capacity. Okay, so the less oxygen you're able to get in, the less oxygen your body's able to utilize. And if you think about temper tantrums, the body's famous for temper tantrums. Okay, all right. Um, how could an, uh, how could applying an occlusive dressing over the chest wounds be of benefit to the patient? And again, we haven't covered that, so you have no idea. But um, the way it would benefit is because it closes off that wound, so no air can get inside the A chest. Total seal. Yeah, a chest seal. It's it's a remember the occlusive dressing, tape it down on three sides. Yes, and leave one side open. Exactly. Or the new like chest seals, they seal on all sides, but they have the flapper valve there, and that takes care of the 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 air. So questions on that? No, 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 no. All right. <sighs> I got to suck myself up for a respiratory system. So take notes, make pictures, uh, understand what is happening with breathing. Okay. So let me back it up and let me do this. All right. So I need to get my list here. All right. Amber. Okay, no amber. All right, Luis. Yes, sir, I'm here. All right. So tell me a function of the respiratory system. It helps you uh, breathe. Okay, and what's the purpose of breathing? To be able to get blood uh, throughout the body and have function throughout it. To get blood? No, to move, to move blood throughout the body. 
How does the respiratory system move blood? Okay, Paul, help us out here. Yes, sir. So give me a respiratory system. I'm sorry? Give me a function of the respiratory system. Um, air going into lungs, out. So, so, get air in and out of the lungs. What do we call the process? What do we call that process? It's a passageway of air from its entry into the body to the lungs and outward. Can you clarify it for me? Um, say nasal, uh, breathing through your nose. No. Okay. So what is the name of the process though? What's the name? You're breaking up. What's the name of that process? Airway? Nope. I mean, the air we're going to go through the respiratory system. No, well, we talk about the respiratory system, and we want to know the functions of the respiratory system. Now, moving air in and out is one of those processes, yeah. but what do we call oh. that process? Isn't it inhalation and exhalation? Okay, but respiration. again, respiration and ventilation. Okay. But what's the difference between respiration and ventilation? Respiration is um, going in, breathing in. Or no, that's respiration. Inhaling. No. Respiration is um, inhaling and exhaling. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sequoia, go for it. Respiration is in the process of moving oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout the membrane. Ventilation is the primary base of changing in pressure inside the chest that causes air flow into and out of the lungs. Okay, so that's what the book says. So can you guys explain to me in your own words what ventilation is? Inhaling and exhaling, like they said. Breathing okay. in CO2 Let and ex no, so, ventilation is letting out. Ventilation is letting out all the gases, all the bad gases. Inhalation is inhaling oxygen. So inhalation is breathing in, exhalation is breathing out. But ventilation itself, it's a mechanical process. There are things that are involved in order to get air in and out of the lungs. So that's ventilation. So when we do artificial ventilation, we are forcing air into the lungs, and then we're relaxing to let the air out of the lungs. So it's a mechanical process. Whereas respirations, as you guys said, is where the blood is or the oxygen is going through a membrane or the gases are going through a membrane. In other words, that's where the actual exchange of gases occurs. Respiration is exchanging gas. Um, Respiration is the actual exchange of gases. And it occurs at two different places. It occurs at the alveolar level, which means that the alveoli, the little sacs at the alveolar. Um, little sacs that are at the end of the, the bronchioles. And, and it also occurs at the cellular level. So when the 
oxygen down to the cells, the oxygen is dropped off and it picks up the carbon dioxide. Okay. Do you know what it's called where that exchange of gases at the alveolar level? Nobody? Okay, at the alveolar level, and this is what I'm talking about, you have the bronchioles that come down, and you have... Okay, so that's the alveoli. So you have the bronchial here, and it gets to the alveoli. So they're like little grapes. And so along the alveoli, you have capillaries. Okay, so the little lines on the outside, those are capillaries. That's where exchange of gases is occurring because the bloodstream got the the white uh, the red blood cells Okay, so you see this right here. So here's the here's the capillary bed. Okay, capillaries are, are so small that the red blood cells fit in one at a time, single file. Okay, now they've dropped off their oxygen supply down at the cellular level, and they picked up the carbon dioxide. And so right now they're full of carbon dioxide, and up here. In the alveoli, we have all that oxygen. So what's going to happen is, and this is what respiration is, and at the alveolar level, it's called external respiration. Okay, At this level, it's external respiration. So you have all these oxygen molecules here. It's, it's heavier here, more concentrated, as opposed to the oxygen level here in the capillary pit. So what happens, does anybody know what that process is called? The oxygen and even carbon dioxide, it's greater in the, in the capillary bed than it is on the outside. So that car carbon dioxide is going to come out here. Anybody know what that process is called? Not really sure. The capillary gas exchange, I think. It, it's there's a process that allows for that capillary gas exchange, and that's occurring at the cellular level too. So the definition of this process is where gases of a higher concentration go to uh, areas of lower concentration. So in the picture, you have concentration of oxygen here, then here. So they're going to move across the membrane. That cellular membrane exchange with Sequoia said. And then the same thing is going to happen. The carbon dioxide is more concentrated here than here. So it's going to go out here to try to, to equalize. Or actually, not even equalize. It's just going to go to lower concentration. So that's the definition. So now, what's the process? Is it internal respiration? No. Internal respiration is the exchange of gases at the cellular level, whereas external respiration is the exchange of gases at the alveolar level. Yes. 
I think it should be oxygenation. No, that's uh, providing oxygen to the body. What about ventilation? Ventilation is the mechanical process. Where we move air in and out of the lungs. So, so yeah, so oxygenation, yeah, that's that's what's happening. Uh, the exchange of gas is higher levels or higher concentration, lower concentration. So, uh, the word is diffusion. Diffusion says that gases of a higher concentration will go across to areas of lower concentration. The best way that I could describe it, forgive the vulgarity, is I, I drop a stink bomb at the front of the classroom. So the people up front are going to smell it pretty quick, right? But eventually it's going to drift back to the back rows and they'll start to smell it. So you see how it's going from a higher concentration drifting down to lower concentration? Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's diffusion. Molecules move across the membrane from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. Yeah. All right, what's the, what's the last function of the respiratory system? The carbon dioxide leaves the blood. The lungs, I mean. Okay. Uh, give me more. Although technically, that's part of it. Carbon dioxide does have something to do with this last function. It sends the waste out of the carbon dioxide. So there's carbon dioxide in the in in the lungs now because it got dropped off, and through ventilation, the mechanical process, we're able to exhale that carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide does have something to do with the, the last function. And it's right here, if you look at the screen, assists with the buffering of the acid-base balance in the body. In other words, when the body starts becoming acidic, it's going to breathe faster because we'll get to it later. Carbon uh, dioxide is building up, and the body doesn't like a buildup of carbon dioxide, so it's going to start to breathe faster to help neutralize the, the acid buildup in the body. Now, when it's become too basic, it's going to slow down the respiration to get a little bit more carbon dioxide buildup because it needs to maintain that acid base balance. Is it with me? Did it make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Okay, so the components of the respiratory system are the nasal cavity, so the nose, the mouth, also known as the pharynx, right in here, and we call that the oral pharynx, and then we have the larynx, which is below the tongue, uh, around the area of the upper body, that's the larynx. We go down to the trachea, which is this long tube. Okay. Now, I don't know why it's important, but you should know. You see where the trachea goes down and then it stops and it we call it bifurcates or it divides into two. See that right here? Yes, no, maybe so? Yes. 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 So here's my pointer. So here's here's the trachea right here, epiglottis up here, hyoid bone cricothyroid membrane. So here's the trachea, and then here goes into the right bronchi and the left bronchi. 
this area right here where it divides, you see that little triangle kind of there? Yeah. Yes. The bronchial tubes? Well, no, no, we're not there yet. This area here is called the carina. Let me change this to that. So this area right here, that's called the carina. C-A-R-I-N-A. Carina. Okay. Then... From so we're right here. So we have the right main stem bronchus and the left main, main stem bronchus. Past the bronchus, the big tubes. So think about a tree. There's the trunk. Here are the branches or the limbs, and then you have the branches and the alveoli are the leaves. Okay. So we have the trachea, the bronchus or the bronchi, then the bronchioles, these branches right here. Or the limbs, I forget. Yeah, the branches. And then the alveoli. And those alveoli and the bronchioles are located within the lung tissue itself. So you have the nasal ca cavity, the nasal pharynx, the oral cavity, the oral pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the Right and left main stem bronchus, the bronchioles, the alveoli, and all that. Uh, the bronchial tree is located within the lungs. Okay. okay. So the airway, we have it into the upper and the lower airway. So a good uh, picture to kind of put it together is that we have nasal and neural pharynx, right? So we have the nose right here. We have the, the tongue, the mouth. So from here up, that's the upper airway. Once we get past the epiglottis into the trachea, so basically from here, all of this, that's the lower airway. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Later on, when we do airway management, knowing the nasal pharynx and oral pharynx, oops, nasal pharynx and oral pharynx is going to be very important. Okay. Re remember that nasal means na nose. So nasal, and then the pharynx is the, the pharyngeal area. All right, we got the larynx, we got the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. We talked about that. So, as we get into the lungs, we talked about the alveoli, they're air filled sacs. Uh, the sacs, they have surfactant. In other words, kind of like an oil. And so that helps glide stuff that helps with uh, air exchange. Now, they're also covered by uh, sacs. The lungs themselves are covered by sacs. And we call those plural sacs. Okay, plural, not like what you learn in school in English, singular and plural. This is has a P-L-E 
U R A L, plural. What those sacks do, and since you guys can't see me when I'm sharing my screen, is Stop sharing. So here's the long. It's long, and then you see how I put another line around that long. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's the long, and then right, right on the outside, there's another line. That's the plural sac. And so what happens is, as soon as I close my marker, what happens is here's the long, right? Here's that plural sac. So as lung is expanding with the air, it glides along that pleural sac and then it collapses. So you see that movement of the sac against the lung? Yeah. So there's a lubricant between the pleural sac and the lung to allow that smooth gl um, gliding, okay? Mm. And then you have the diaphragm, the diaphragmatic muscle. That's the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a is a dome shaped muscle, and it does contract and relax like other muscles. And so that's going to be involved with respiration, with breathing in and out. Okay. So here we go. Another uh, another good um, picture here. Okay. Trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and the alveolar are at the end. Okay. So one of the things that that happens to vest uh, uh, to smooth muscle. So the bronchioles are smooth muscle. Okay, and they can they can contract and relax. I'm sorry, contract and dilate. And there's no A in dilate other than, yeah, dilate. yeah, there is. It's not dilate, it's dilate. Dilation is getting bigger, constriction, it's getting smaller. So depending on how much air you need, they're either going to get bigger to allow more air to go through, or they're going to get smaller to reduce the amount of air that's needed. Okay, so... Constriction, dilation, and that happens to smooth muscles, such as the bronchioles, okay? Now, something for kids. So there you go, the lungs, there's the, the diaphragm, the floor, the sac that's around it. So you see the bronchial, there's the muscle around the bronchial. You see the normal opening? and the air is able to move freely. When you have a constricted bronchial for whatever reason, you notice how you have the inflammation here, it's tightened up, it's very narrowed, plus you got mucus within that bronchial. So how much air is passing through that compared to that one right there? Big difference. Big difference. So that's reducing the amount of air that's flowing through there. You think your body's gonna be like, hey dude, time out. Don't do that to me, right? No. <laughs> so, with kids, a couple things to remember with the airway. Now, first off, the airway is very, very important with pediatric patients, with kids, especially little ones, because their bodies haven't fully developed yet. So they lean on the respiratory drive big time. Whereas adults, we tend to lean on our circulatory drive. But kids lean on their respiratory drive. So make sure you take that into consideration. Now, as far as the airway, obviously it's going to be smaller. They have a smaller area. Look at the size of the trachea there compared to this. So how much oxygen are they getting through here? 
compared to that. Big difference. Huge difference. Okay. The other thing is the tongue is bigger in proportion than an adult. Okay. Think about the tongue. It's bigger in kids than it is in adults. Um, the tongue. We talked about the airway. The nose is smaller than the mouth. Now, the other thing is the trachea. You see the, the white strips right here? Yeah. Those strips are called, they're, they're cartilage. So when kids are small, that cartilage hasn't fully developed. So it's less rigid. In other words, it's easier to block. And the last thing is, you notice how the adult set at the bottom is bringing the trachea in line, and he, he is in somewhat of a sniffing position, okay? However, the kid, because their head is bigger in proportion to their body, you need to expend, uh, uh, extend it even more. And so, do you see the problem with using no padding, pattern, I'm sorry, padding on a pediatric patient? In that case, you put a towel behind her neck to even out. Shoulders. shoulders. Underneath the shoulders. Yeah, that will lift that up and bring the airway into alignment. And you won't have a a blockage in the airway, preventing oxygen from reaching the lungs. Okay. All right. Mm, questions? Mm, no. No. Oh. Okay. So, going back to my list, um, no, Andy or Ashley's here, Brandon I talked to, I don't have my list, what is it, Mr. Berserks, are you there? Yes. Okay. So, talk to me about the mechanical process of breathing. What is happening when you're taking a breath? You're inhaling. Okay. What's going to happen to your body? Yes, you're inhaling. But what is your body doing in order to be able to inhale? To, uh... Well, I guess it kind of, uh, it's like the contraction of the dia the diaphragm, which is the diaphragm. Okay. Yeah. So the diaphragm contracts. What else? Um. All right, that's fine. Uh, Miss Elena, 
what else happens in order for inhalation to occur? What is your body doing? Um, hold on a second. Let me look real quick. Okay. Um, mechanical ventilation. The the mechanics of the yeah. ventilation, right? Yeah. Yeah, breathing in. Uh, uh, breathing in. Well, a ventilator uses <clears throat> pressure to blow air or a mixture of gases like oxygen and air into the okay. lungs. Okay, so we need to get that oxygen to the lungs. So we know that the diaphragm is going to contract. What else is going to occur in order to get that oxygen? Inspiration and expiration? Yeah, we want to know what's happening in inspiration. What is that mechanical process? You you usually um, you usually exhale, breathe out the air of your own. Okay. All right, Kevin. What can you tell me about the mechanical process of breathing in? We know that the diaphragm contracts. What else happens? Um, all the all the muscles around your ribs also contract, including your lungs. Well, no, the lungs aren't going to contract. But well, you're right. Expand. Sorry, the, the lungs expand. Okay. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But you're right. The intercostal muscles are going to contract, opening up that rib cage because the lungs are going to get bigger. So it's getting ready for those lungs to get bigger. Okay. So inner muscles, intercostal muscles contract, the diaphragm. Uh, so you have all that allowing the lips, uh, the, the, the lungs to be able to expand. Okay. So now what happens is, remember we were talking pressures earlier, higher concentration going to lower concentration? Yeah. Okay. So what happens is now there's a negative pressure within the chest. And on the outside, there's a higher atmospheric pressure. And so in the, it's going to go to try and equalize. So that's what's happening. Because of the negative pressure in the lungs and the positive pressure on the outside, that positive pressure, and now because there's that expanded area, that air goes into the lungs. Okay. That's how the air gets in. Now, in the exhalation, where we're breathing out, oh, before I, I get to that. So the, the process of the inhalation, the muscles contracting, diaphragm contracting, uh, creating that negative pressure, that's called an active process, A-C-T-I-V-E, active. And the reason it's an active process, George, you got to put your background noise, so I'm going to mute you. Um, the reason it's an active process is because there's actually an expansion of energy. We need energy to contract the muscles. So think about when you have no energy, you haven't eaten, you're depressed, you have a day off. How much energy do you have to do anything? You don't, right? No. Because there's no energy there. You, you haven't eaten, so you haven't built up that energy. So that's why it's active. You're not very active, but active process as you're using up energy. Now, for the muscles to relax in inhalation, that, that's called a passive process. We don't have to expand energy to relax the, the muscles. So that's a passive process. So now what happens is the intercostal muscles relax, the diaphragm relaxes, and it's still a positive pressure inside the lungs, but the pressure is higher on the, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the pressure is higher in the lungs than it is on the outside. And so now the opposite is occurring. The positive pressure is going to the 
kind of n negative pressure or lower pressure on the outside and that air comes out. You guys with me on that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So that's going to be an important concept to understand active and passive process. Active, the muscles are contracting and it's the intercostal muscles in the diaphragm creating a negative pressure so the air, the positive pressure from the outside is going in. Exhalation, it's a passive process. Now you have a positive pressure on the inside, negative pressure on the outside. And so the air is going to go from the lungs into the outside. Okay. All right. So you see here, this is the actual slide that talks about the mechanics. Intercostal muscles contract, uh, pulling the rib cage open, the diaphragm contracts, a positive or the negative pressure, you get the positives going in. And now on the opposite, intercostal muscle relax, arm relaxes, decreasing the, the size of the rib cage. And so positive pressure going out into, oops, sorry, I forgot I don't have my drawing. Uh, positive pressure going out to the negative pressure. Okay. Okay. Now, <sighs> so we talked about internal and external respiration. Where is internal respiration occurring? In the cells. Inside your lungs. Okay. No, internal is in the cells. So, Rosie, the one occurring in the lungs is which one? So, if internal respiration is occurring in the cells, which one is occurring at the alveolar level? External. External respiration. Good. Okay. So, that's where the exchange of gases actually occurs. Okay, so I know there's a lot of ambient noise with everybody. And you know what, that smoke detector might be mine, but I can't find our smoke detector. Anyway, so listen in right now. Some people have their mic on, some, actually everybody has their mic muted from what I'm seeing. There, somebody turned it on. Okay. I think that's Brandon. Yeah, that's me. Okay. So, for those that have the mic on, can you hear them breathing? Yes, no, maybe so. Well, I don't hear nobody. That was? No. What I'm getting at is, did you hear anybody breathing? Oh, yeah. No. 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 It's like a no. No. once everybody turns the mic off. Yeah, people have their mics off and, and their cameras off. Um, that's going to be an issue we'll, we'll address later. But remember, I want your cameras on so I know you're there. Okay. Especially if I'm calling on you and you don't answer. Okay. I want to see your face to know that you're, you're here. Okay. This is going to be a real test. I'm going to tell you right now. It's going to be a very real test. All right. So going back to, to breathing. One of the things that, that I learned from paramedic school uh, professor, the main one, the primary, was you can't know what abnormal is until you know what normal is. And that was kind of profound, but it's very true. And so this is a great example of understanding what normal is. 
yeah, people are muted. But for those of you that weren't muted and you were breathing near your microphone, did we hear any noises coming from them? Because I know there was people unmuted. Did we hear anybody breathe? No. Could you hear me breathe? Because my obviously my microphone is on. Yes. Did you hear me breathe? Yes. You heard me breathe? No. No. Exhale and inhale. Yeah. And that's what I'm getting at. Normal breathing is quiet. It's effortless. We don't have to think about breathing. There's no noises coming out. Now, if you show up and your patient's there and they're... <sighs> is that abnormal? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. Did you hear me breathe? Yeah. Did you hear yes. me make noises? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And what did we say about breathing? Normal breathing. Are we going to hear we noises? You shouldn't hear anything. No. You should just suck your You shouldn't hear anything. Noise. Exactly. So you that should tell you there's abnormal. Yeah. You could be using the diaphragm. So, yeah, that's what we were getting at is the fact that breathing is effortless. We shouldn't hear anything. So when we hear <laughs> something. Oh, wait. That's abnormal. Okay. Um, now the other things we're going to do to check adequate and inadequate breathing is the respiratory rate. An adult's respiratory rate is going to be between six, I'm sorry, ten, ugh, twelve and twenty times a minute. Okay. Normal adult respiratory rate is between twelve and twenty times a minute. What about a child? For a child, it's going to be between 15, one five, and you double it up and you get what? Fifteen and you double it. What do you 30. get? Thirty. Thirty. So that's the normal respiratory rate for a child, fifteen to thirty. Now an infant the normal respiratory rate is from 25, and then double that up, what do you get? 50. 50. There you go. So the normal respiratory rate for an infant is 25 to 50 times a minute. All right. Um, okay, other things that you're going to see with inadequate breathing is what we call accessory muscle use. In other words, we're starting to use intercostal muscles and primarily the intercostal muscles up in here, up on the top of the of the rib cage, right up in here. You're gonna see nasal flaring in the nostrils. You see my nostrils getting bigger? Yes. Yeah. So why do you think that the the nostrils are going to get bigger. To help. Exactly. If we make that the diameter, so right now we're, we're this way, okay? So we have X amount of air going in. But the body is saying, hey, I need some more oxygen. The respiratory system is like, got you, dude. And it goes, mm. so what happened to the amount of oxygen I can get in? It increased. It increased. Okay. So, um, and this is kind of a chapter eight discussion, but I'm going to introduce it to you now. 
and that is what we call homeostasis. Have you guys heard of homeostasis before? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay, so what does homeostasis mean to you? Um, I know what the book says. It's a state of equilibrium. But I want to know what homeostasis means to you. It maintains your... Uh, uh. Equilibrium? Yes. Let me see. Okay. Does Give it have to do with the white blood cells? To nope. Make, like maintain cold, no? Temperature? Homostasis? Core temperature? Yeah. Hey. It was in some Partly, yeah, that. but... Yeah, Balance. a little bit. Balance of what? I just remember it's balance of something. Thought it was the cells or the body? It's balance of the body. Okay. Demia, what do you think? Honestly, I have no clue. Okay. It's all right. That's why we're in here learning, right? I will give you my definition in a minute. Uh, Frankie, you still there? Mr. Frank? Yes, sir. <clears throat> all right. What does homeostasis mean to you? I'm trying to put it into my own word. Isn't it like, oh, my bad. I'll let him answer. I know it says in the book it's like equilibrium, but uh, I uh -huh. guess it's just, um, I know that most of the people mention it's balance. Um, so it's just to keep uh, tranquil tranquility in the body, just to keep everything stable. Okay. So, how many of you saw the movie Happy Gilmore? Me. Me. Okay. A couple of you. <laughs> Do you remember the scene where he, he, he went out and I forget the uh, Carl Weathers' character's name. The guy that lost the hand to the alligator. Oh, yeah. The guy played yeah. Apollo Creed. Okay. Yes. And he tells them, send it to its happy place. He's like, go to your happy place. Go to your happy place, right? Yeah, I remember. Okay. So the way that I describe homeostasis is the body wants to go to its happy place. Where it feels, where it feels normal. Another way to think about it as well is think about about little kids, the infants, right? When they're they're in mom's arms and they get scared, or somebody, yeah, somebody scares them, or they see an ugly big loo, and they they they're attached to mom like koala bears are to trees, and and then they just bury their their heads, right? You can picture that. Yeah. So isn't it a, a baby's safe safe a uh, safe a sp safe space safe place? Ugh, I can't talk this morning. Uh, right there in mom's arms. Yeah. Okay. So that's exactly what what it is is that the body's happy place where it feels safe and secure. So I mentioned this to you earlier that um, remember the body's going to do what it can to take care of itself because it wants to stay in its happy place. Yes. Excuse me. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So Think about that as homeostasis. The body's going to do what it can to take care of itself to go back to its happy place. That's where it wants to be. And so it's going to tell the body, hey, I need some help. The other things we're going to see when the body is uh, needing oxygen, yeah, the, the nostrils are going to get bigger. 
our accessory muscles are going to be working to really help the chest expand because the bigger the chest, the more oxygen that's going to come in, the more oxygen is going to be delivered to the body. Okay. Now, how does the oxygen go through the body? Into the nose. Okay, but I, I don't mean how does it get inside the body. I'm going to say how does it get around in the body? Through your blood. Through the blood. And what circulates the blood? The vessels. Which vessels? Um... The blood vessels. The blood yeah. vessels. Okay, but what pushes the blood out? The heart. The heart. The heart. The heart. Okay. Um, so the circulatory system is going to circulate that oxygen. So if the if the body's detecting that there's not a lot of not a lot of oxygen going around the body, what do you think the body's going to tell the circulatory system to do? To provide more. Pump uh, more blood. Pump more blood. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen to that heart rate? It's going to go up. It's going to go up. It's going to go up. Yeah. Yeah, we call it tachycardia, uh, fast heart rate. All right. Um, okay, so the heart rate's going to speed up. What do you think is going to happen to the respiratory rate? It's going to increase also. Increase. Exactly, right? Because it's needing more oxygen in order to do what it can? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so heart rate's going to go up. Um, respiratory rate's going to go up. Uh, nasal flaring, accessory muscle use. The other thing that's going to happen is what we call tripod. In other words, uh, the patient will be leaning forward, usually with their arms in front of them between their legs, leaning forward. They're tr trying to expand the chest more, get more air in. Um, Oh, the other thing that we're going to see is we're going to see the skin pale, cool, and cloudy. In other words, they're going to be pale. Our skin, our temperature is going to be cool, and they're also going to be sweaty. Here's the reason why. Remember I said that the skin needs to take care of itself, right? And what's yeah. most important for the body has to take care of? The brain. Brain and the next important organ is what the heart. Well, then it's the liver and then the kidneys. Now, yes, way down the list is another body system, and it's the largest organ of the body. What do you think it is? Um, the skin, it's what. 
The skin. The skin. It is the skin. Okay. The largest organ in the body. So according to the body, the hierarchy of the body, the skin is insignificant. And so what it does is it's going to close off certain muscles, certain blood vessels, and it's going to take that blood that would normally go to the skin, and it's going to try and keep it in the core to be able to take those take care of those important organs the brain the heart the liver the kidneys okay so be right. blood flow to the skin that's why we have those changes so you see how important the respiratory system is yes yeah it needs, it needs to get that oxygen it needs to deliver it to the organs and it's going to get help from the heart speed uh, speed up get blood there now, understand this. When we're talking about blood and oxygen, it's a direct relationship. Blood equals oxygen. However, oxygen doesn't necessarily equal blood. If you're losing no. blood, you're losing, uh, you're losing oxygen. You're losing the ability to carry that oxygen. But if you're losing oxygen, you're not necessarily losing blood volume unless, there's a, unless you're hemorrhaging or bleeding out. <laughs> So blood equals oxygen, but oxygen does not equal blood, if it makes sense. Yes. Okay. So, so you see the changes that occur? Yeah. Okay. So this is what I was talking about earlier. You see all that oxygen that, so you have the blood uh, the blood vessels, the, the capillaries, where these are the red blood cells, and they're d dumping off the carbon dioxide because the concentration is greater here. Let me get my marker. The, the concentration is greater here. Where's my arrow? Then it is in here of carbon dioxide. So, all this carbon dioxide is going to move into the alveoli. Now, the oxygen level is greater in here than it is in here. So, that's going to move in there. So, that's the exchange of gases, okay? And it's the same thing that happens not just in the alveoli, uh, alveolar level, but also in the cellular level, down at the cell. So, you have here... There's nucleus, all the other stuff. So the O2 is moving in the cell, and the other two is moving out of the cell. So here's the bloodstream. So there goes the CO2, and the O2, again, it's going that way. CO2 is going that way. Okay. Uh -huh. Yay, yay, nay. Yay. Yes. All right. Are your minds blown this morning? What is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Definitely a lot right. been taken out. Yeah, for sure. I didn't even a lot yeah. of this stuff, like, at all. Water. And I didn't even yeah. knew it went so deep. Oh, it does. And like I said, I want to make sure you get this down. Huge. Uh, cardiology is huge. You have to understand because really, when, even when we're talking about trauma, the gunshot or the stabbing to the dude in the scenario, we talked about the possibility of bleeding, right? Yes. So what I just said about that relationship, you're losing blood, you're losing oxygen. And the body, I know the body needs oxygen because if we stop breathing, what happens to us? Die. Die. We die. So we need that oxygen to be going into the cells. Okay. We need that oxygen going into the cells. And we need to get rid of that carbon dioxide and then expel it out. Okay. So here's what I just drew in the in the previous slide. You have the cells there. There goes the CO2. Here comes the O2. So these are the numbers I gave you. Adequate and inadequate breathing. 
yeah, that in there. All right, so <clears throat> was Andrew assessment of the patient's breathing reviews respirations of 30 per minute that are shallow. So is that adequate? Somebody say no. Hey, what, you, what was the question? No. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> Smart Alex. <laughs> But I did ask for it. Um, I asked if the breathing, that breathing, thirty times of thirty times a minute is adequate. Okay. No. <laughs> no, because this is an adult, right? And what is the range of breathing for an adult? Twelve to twenty. Twelve to twenty. Twelve to twenty. So. So let me use this example. And you'll see how the person is not getting enough air. So Rosie gets into a fight. And she nails this girl right in the ribs. And we won't say she used her fist. She used a, 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 a baseball bat. Because it's baseball season and she's a big Dodger fan, so. You know, she, she's trying to take out that aggression. And this girl happened to say something about whatever. And so Rosie, what was that? I must need anger management then. Nah, it's, it's, it's allowed because cooped up and the Dodgers aren't playing right now. And they were cheated out of the World Series a couple years ago, so. <sighs> but I digress. I, I'm still a little bit bitter, but I'll I'll, I'll let it go for now. Do you know you. what my baseball team is? So anyway, so this girl is holding her rib cage, right? Mm. Champagne. Just think about it. You just got hit in the ribs. I don't mean in the stomach or knock the wind out of you. I mean in the ribs, really hard. Is it hurting? Yeah. 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 Okay, now take that pain and try to take a deep breath. Can you? No. no. You struggle? No. No. No, you can't it's take a deep breath. What was that? Rosie, what did you say? Isn't it like constricting your airway? Well, it's not constricting your airway, but it's preventing you from taking a full deep breath, right? Because yes. it, it hurts so much, you start going to take that breath, and then that pain hits you. So what happened to the death of your respirations? They diminish. Okay, why? Ah. Longer breaths. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> Right. The breaths are going to be shallow because you cannot take a full deep, deep breath. breath because it hurts. And so your body's compensating, and that's why it's 30 breaths a minute. So the patient will be, let me get rid of that. So as you're seeing me, you'll be like, <laughs> because it hurts to take a full deep breath. So you see the rapid respirations? So remember I told you I'm I'm trying to think. And so these scenarios with these questions, that's what I'm trying to get you to do. When I put yourself in their position. Two, you need yeah. to be able to think through the process. I hit you in the ribs. I usually hit for, for this demonstration. 
but I can't I can't hit Rosie because she will kick my ass <laughs> afterwards. Um, but, but again, think about getting hit in the ribs. It hurts so much, and your body wanting to go back to its happy place. Remember, it's going to do what it can to take care of itself. It's going to be, breathe faster. They're going to be shallow because it's trying to maintain the level. There's, it's trying to maintain an equilibrium. But that's only going to go so far. Because after a period of time of not enough oxygen, what do you think the brain's going to do? Uh. Well, after a time of no oxygen? Well, you like well, not time. no oxygen, but minimum oxygen. It's going to start shutting down. Yeah, it, it's going to shut down. It's going to say, fuck this. Why yeah. are you not taking care of me? I just can't keep going. Fuck this. And so the person will be drowsy. They'll lose consciousness. Eventually, not enough oxygen, it's going to kill brain cells, and you kill enough brain cells, the person's going to die. Okay. All right. So, are, are you seeing my point about getting you guys to think, teaching you how to think? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, here's another, another trick and another secret is when I went through EMT school, we literally were in a list of signs and symptoms for different things. And that's fine and dandy. And I could do the same thing to you guys. I could give you a quiz that's not multiple choice, that's fill in the blank, and then you have to fill in the signs and symptoms for shortness of breath. Can you remember all? Maybe, maybe not. But... Now, let's change it up. And this is the trick that I learned in paramedic school. Yeah, we can learn a list of signs and symptoms, but isn't it better to think through the problem and say, okay, if I can't catch my breath, what is my body going to do? It's going to breathe faster. Yes. I'm going to have nasal flaring. I'm going to have accessory muscle use. I'm going to be tripoding. I'm going to be pale, cool, and clammy. I'm going to be tachypnic, which means uh, increased respiratory rate. I'm going to be tachycardic, which means I'm going to have an increased pulse rate. Can you add your body will go into shock? Well, it, it will eventually. Mm. What kind of shock? Lack of we'll oxygen. Get into, yeah. Well, there's different like, types of shock. That's the thing. There's different types of shock, but just real quick, and believe it or not, this is a definition I learned in the summer of 1999. So it's been wow. 20 years, almost 21 years since I learned this definition. And this is a definition word for word. It just stuck with me. The definition of shock is the rapid and progressive degeneration of vital, bo vital body function brought on by inadequate tissue perfusion of oxygen. That's Definition I learned, word for word. Why I still remember it 21 years later, I have no idea. But I did. Can you type good it word for word on the thing? What was that? Can you type it word by word on the chat? Hi. Well, well, we'll do it later when we start uh, doing uh, shock. All right. But it's just because Rosie, you brought it up shock, so I'm like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna show off and show them that definition. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh. Um, so uh continuing with this case study. So are the patient's ventilations adequate or inadequate? And tell me why. They're inadequate. Why? Because he's not breathing normally. What do you mean? Not yes, Prove your answer breathing. to me. Okay, you got shallow breathing. Yes. What else? 
Um, give me a second. Uh, agonal breathing. Uh, no, he wasn't in agonal breathing. He's breathing 30 times a minute. Yeah, the adequate respiratory rate for adults is 12 to 20 minutes. So it's inadequate. It's okay. Over. Here's a little something to remember for National Registry and even my test as well. Trust me, you will see it on, on the exams and on the quizzes because I'm really trying to reinforce this. Whenever you have a patient that's breathing eight or less or greater than 24, the way you, you give them oxygen is via positive pressure ventilation. That's also known as bag valve mass, BVM. So we're going to bag them. Okay. So this patient, how are you going to deliver oxygen to him? BVM. BVM, good. Why? Because he's breathing more than 20. 24. More than, more than 24. Yes. All right. The next question. How are the patient's injuries affecting his body at a cellular level? Um, having trouble breathing, which is causing, uh, uh, I guess, lack of oxygen. I don't know if that. There um, you go. Good. That's causing. Yeah, like there's the a tongue. decrease. There's decreased oxygen level going to the cells. Good. Very good. Okay. So we've reached the circulatory system, so we'll break here. Now, do you know why it, this lecture takes two days? Yeah. Yes. There's a yeah. lot of stuff, and, and I know I talk a lot, but I want to make sure you understand the concept or the concepts here. The respiratory system is huge. Again, we, we get in the oxygen that's needed for life and we get rid of the stuff we don't need, but it's trees. Carbon dioxide or plants utilize carbon dioxide. And when they synthesize that, they release oxygen, which we need. So you see that, that symbiotic relationship? Yes. And so yeah. now, now do you see why they, they're freaking out about the Amazon rainforest? Yeah. Because as, as it disappears and as forests disappear, uh, we're not producing a lot of oxygen to the, to the world and input the rest of the story yourselves. Not saying that I'm a tree hugger. I'm just saying that's the concept. But no, we should we should take care of our environment, honestly. All right. Um, do you guys have any questions? No, sir. No, sir. No, no sir. No. Was this a good class? You enjoyed it? Hey, Lou. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. What was the the term you used? Um, where the patients uh, um, have less than eight or more than eighty four breaths per minute no um what, what i was saying is use? yeah any patient the way that you deliver oxygen to a patient that's breathing eight or less mm -hmm. or greater than 24 um the way you deliver it is utilizing positive pressure ventilation okay which really translates into uh, a bag valve mask, BVM. You're going to bag them. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. All righty. Have a good day, so, everybody. So uh, just review that. You will have a quiz tomorrow on what we've covered so far. So we won't cover cardiovascular because we didn't do it. So there's no reason to test you out on it. Okay. Uh, please study, learn the structures, oropharynx, nasopharynx, the pharynx, the larynx, the upper airway, the lower airway. Learn what internal respiration is. Learn what external respiration is. 
learn the difference between ventilation and respiration. Learn abnormal or yeah, abnormal uh, respirations. What's happening? Remember what I said: tachycardia, tachypnea, pelco clammy skin, nasal flaring, accessory muscle use, tripoding. Cyanosis is also a sign. In other words, the skin becomes blue, but that's going to be a late sign. In other words, the patient is going to respiratory failure, and we'll cover that when we get into respiratory emergencies. But uh, basically, the body is going to eventually give up. Just think about it. You give up on somebody because they just kept doing the same thing over and over and over, and you're like, fuck this. I don't need them. Goodbye. You're the weakest link. So. Uh, yeah, I watch too much TV and movies. I know, I know. So. Well, I'm glad you guys enjoyed today's lecture. Um Someone asked if it was going to be emailed or EMS testing. It's yeah, just I just I just got that. Uh, it's going to be like we normally do. All right. So you'll have the forms. I'll send you the link, and you just go on there and take the quiz. But try to be on time. Like with my night class, they're taking way too long. Some of them log in late. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing I could do about kicking them out to go take the test or the quiz. So please try to be on time. Okay, um, to take this so we can get out of the way because there's a lot of stuff to cover still. Cardiology is a big chapter also. Okay, and unfortunately, the the cardiovascular system is my favorite system of the body. So uh, I just love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love talking about it. And I love teaching it. Okay. So. Um, we have a lot to cover, and we'll finish off the rest of the chapter tomorrow. Once we get past cardiology, it's all downhill from there. Okay. Any comments, questions? No. No, no. sir. No, sir. No. Okay. All right, then. Uh, I am done, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your of your Tuesday, and I will see you. And turn on your cameras tomorrow. Thank you, sir. I'll, I, I won't brush my hair tomorrow, right. so that way you guys don't feel bad. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. All right. All right. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.